Join us every month as filmmaker, author, and prolific speaker Kate Chaplin takes a movie that has shaped her life, for good or bad, and dissects it to find the meanings and universality of its messages. This is Kate's Take. Episode 1, What Dreams May Come and How a Death is Really a New Beginning into a Greater Journey. Sometimes the story doesn't start at the beginning. Sometimes it starts at the end. I was born the same year that Charlie Chaplin died. The man who lit the spark for filmmaking had already left this earth when I picked up my first camera. I had learned from him the immortality of film and how we can still learn from the greats that are no longer with us. So what went through your mind when you heard of William's passing? Uh, it was a lot harder, actually, than I expected. Um, I probably, like many other people, kind of felt like I was losing a family member. I felt like he was my funny uncle that I, I don't get to see all that often. He was... The ones that I always turned to in times of sadness or doubt, um, I knew I could always go to the theater or watch on my TV and laugh and love and learn. Um, I remember when my brother and I were actually allowed to pick the movie at the video store. This was a very rare event when we got to pick what we wanted to bring home. Generally what it was is if there wasn't a good new release, then we got to pick. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that, well, lack of options, fine, you get to pick. But uh, my brother and I, we would pick uh, a Robin Williams stand-up. Like, it didn't matter how many times we had seen it. Uh, we would we would pick one up, and we'd watch it, and we would laugh till our belly hurt. And uh, we would get in trouble, generally, for quoting way too many of the saucy one-liners, if you will, uh, that Williams has. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about his passing, though, is that the thing that I was mourning the most was new jokes and new material and new smiles that I would have and just that smiling face on the screen whenever I needed it. Mm. It was a really odd thing hearing about his passing because normally if I'm hearing about somebody's passing, I want to watch something funny. I want to cheer myself up. And, and this was the guy that I would watch to cheer myself up. And so now it was kind of ironic that, uh, that the guy that was always there um, that there'd be no more new stuff from him. Just in the the last two months, there's been an awful lot of celebrities who have passed away. And, and it's been incredibly More than the three rule. Yeah. I liken Robin Williams, carefully liken it, but liken Robin Williams' passing to having the same sort of effect and a, a very similar outpouring of emotion just looking at social media and looking at, at Facebook as uh, what I saw when Diana, Princess of Wales, passed away. That's very true. Yeah. It's a celebrity, or it's a figure that has touched your life, that has been part of it, not just an outside, but actually reached through that that screen and reached through that crowd and really touched you in some way. Yeah. I remember where I was the day I found out Diana died, I, and I and I believe it will be the same yes. with Robin Williams. And I think it's something that was just incredibly tragic. And I think that's also more so of it too. It's the tragedy of it. Yeah. Um, you know, they were not later on in their years. This was not a, they had growing health problems and, you know, and, and then they passed. This was, this is too soon. Yeah. They had more work to do. They had more things to give to the world. And so it's more of a tragedy. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why it kind of, it hits us pretty hard and kind of reminds us of how, how mortal we are. <laughs> These are our larger than life people in life. And so, so why did you choose What Dreams May Come for the first show? Because I know that like before, uh, when we were planning for the show, for the first episode, mm -hmm. we were looking at different, we weren't actually looking at the path of Robin Williams. And then we felt, uh, you know, it's it's enough time has passed, mm -hmm. uh, but not too much time has passed. It sort of fits nicely as a, as a, as a nice sort of hat tip. But you then had to pick the movie that you were, you know, you were going to select from this just uh, plethora of amazing. amazing movies. Yeah. So why, yeah. why what dreams make come? A lot of movies to pick from. Um, well, I, I really, I did have to think long and hard about it because, um, and I even, I posted on Facebook too, you know, uh, would it be weird? Um, is it something that, you know, we don't want to talk about Robin Williams yet? We just, you know, or, you know, is it one of those things where it's just like, I want to move past it. I'm not ready to talk about it. I'm not ready to absorb it. But, I found myself having to watch his movies after hear of his passing. And a lot of my friends were too. Um, they were popping in his movies just like I was and we were remembering and we were re-embracing these movies. Um, and it really kind of showed how these movies, they're, they're personal. Um, they're not just flickering images that have pixie dust kind of in between each frame. 
Um, the reason why I went with What Dreams May Come, it was kind of actually like the serendipitous moment. Um, and it wasn't until really I kind of looked at all of his movies to try to figure out what was the one that really kind of hit me, that influenced my life in a different way. And it actually happened, I bought a copy of Stephen Simon's book. And Stephen Simon is the producer of What Dreams May Come, and also Somewhere in Time and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And this book is called The Force is With You. So, of course, as a Star Wars fan, I love the title. Um, <laughs> but what he does in the book is he takes 70 movies and he talks about the mythic messages that are within the movies. So I read the book, like, in a night. It was fantastic. Right. Um, but I was taken aback. He was watching movies the same way that I watch movies. And usually I'm always being chastised of, you know, it's just funny pictures on the screen. You're thinking about it too much. But in this book, he was thinking about it as much as I was thinking about it. And many of my personal memories relate to the movie that I was seeing around that time. They're very interconnected. So Kate's take that we're doing now, which is fantastic, it kind of spun from Stephen Simon's ability to show me that this is an okay way to think. That it's okay to take these movies, incorporate them into your life, and to share that with others. So... In his book, he's very kind of general about the way that he talks about movies replying to, or, you know, universality to everybody. But my stories are much more personal. And it's it's about what I went through. And it not everybody has gone through what I have gone through, but they're still universal in their stories. Um, it's still um, struggle and conflict and adversity and fun and laughter um, I just adore movies and I've just had this blessing of being able to see the right movie at the right time in my life and to be able to process that. And I want everybody else to be able to have that, uh, that ability. So, I mean, some of the examples that are going to be coming up is, uh, I relate Finding Nemo to the Iraq war. Um, the terminal with Tom Hanks was the kick in the pants for me to start actually making films again. And I learned that my best friend in high school was anti-Semitic when we went and saw Schindler's List together. So, and and later on, you'll even find out why E.T. is the scariest <laughs> movie alive. <laughs> when your mom is in the hospital and you think the doctors are trying to kill your mom. So, so that's what I'm hoping to do with the show. And that's why What Dreams May Come and Stephen Simon's book, it just seemed like, yes, this is where it started for me. And even the poster on What Dreams May Come is The End is Only the Beginning. So it all kind of, you know, it just felt really right that mm. um, the, you know, the end of talking about one of Robin Williams' movies is the beginning to be able to talk about Kate's take and how these movies, they don't actually leave us. They keep with us and they keep with us in new ways. Where, where were you when you first saw What Dreams May Come? Like, you know, how old were you? What were you doing? And, and what was going on in your life for, for this movie to have such an impact? Um, I was in L.A. at the time. I was uh, 21. I had just gotten married. Um, and I was working in a video store. Uh, Suncoast <laughs> Video. I don't know. I don't think they exist anywhere anymore. Um, I miss Suncoast Video. It was like the coolest place in the mall when I was a kid. <laughs> so the fact that I got to work there and I was a store manager of the Thousand Oaks store, um, I, I absolutely adored it. I got to talk about movies all day. I got to organize movies all day. I know a lot of movies by their cover box. <laughs> <laughs> Describe to me what's on the box and then I can I can show you where the movie is. It's, it's a very weird skill. Um, but I was on a break from writing. And so I was watching like tons of movies. Uh, my husband and I, we would go to the movie theater about twice, sometimes three times a week, depending on what was coming out. Um, and then on our two days off, we'd rent, we'd go to this place called Blockbuster. Remember that place that also closed down? I vaguely remember that place. Yeah, blue, bluish yellow. Yes, it was yellow and blue and you get these physical things. You don't download them. You don't just click on them. They're physical items and you're only allowed to have six physical items at a time. Um, so we'd, we'd max it out. We'd get uh, six movies and, uh, and we'd watch them out. Um, and just veg on the couch. Now, a few months before What Dreams May Come came out, it was the first AFI list. I don't know if you remember the AFI 100. Yeah. This was the very first one. So I was very much trying to watch all 100 films at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so when when this one came out, um, I, I knew that we were going to go see it. Um, uh, my husband's favorite film is Dead Poet Society. He loves it so much he calls it DPS. 
Uh, he's like, that's very DPS of you, or I gotta get my DPS on. I don't know why it has a shorthand. <laughs> um, he also weirdly follows Robert Sean Leonard in his movie career. He finds it amazing that Robert Sean Leonard dies in most of the movies that he's in. This is true. <laughs> and I'm like, this is... <laughs> It's weird. And I'm like, well, you should watch House. He's like, I don't think he's going to die in House. <laughs> so he doesn't. It's very weird. But but we love Robin Williams. We're big Robin Williams fans. So we actually went and we saw it opening night. I knew it was going to be sad. I mean, the trailer does not hide it from you. No. Um, that it's about, uh, it's about death and it's about going through heaven and hell. Um, and it's this love story. So uh, I wanted to sit in the back. Because... <laughs> I have this weird thing about crying in public. Uh, I fight it. I go a little sheepish sometimes, you know, that when you have that cry inside and it gets a little high pitched. Um, I, I didn't want to be that person that was crying so hard that I was disrupting other people's time. Um, I I think I'm trying to do it to not ruin other people, but at the same time, it's a mask that I'm wearing that I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to get that uh, that off. You have this mask on. You you're, you're trying to protect yourself. Was there any sort of even like the slight waterworks happening. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, there I, were, I there are cracks in the wall. There was lots of cracks in the wall. This movie will totally do that for you. Um I, I totally did cry while I was watching the movie. Not as loudly as the woman behind me. Um this was the <laughs> the loudest I ever heard somebody else cry in the theater. She was howling. She I mean, it sounded like this movie was made for her, actually. Mm. Um, the mm. way that she was connecting to this movie and the parts that she was crying at, it was kind of almost like a third wall experience. And I felt bad because I didn't reach out to her. Mm. So one of those things, I didn't even look to see if she was by herself or if she was with people. Um, but I just knew that she was really feeling this movie. And, uh, and I think that probably also allowed me to kind of be able to shed some waterworks uh, in public in a dark theater. <laughs> and of course, it's one of those things where when, I, when you actually cry in a theater, I don't know if I'm the only one, you sit there through the entire credits. I sit through the credits anyway, but you definitely sit there through the credits to try to like fix your face. <laughs> I'm not going to walk outside with tears streaming down my face. I don't want to be that person. So you get your stuff together. <laughs> Wait for time. <laughs> now, now, the movie was uh, released September 28th, 1998. And it's actually based on a 1978 science fiction novel. Yes, by Richard Matheson. That's right. Who is fantastic. Yes. Oh, phenomenal, phenomenal writer. And, you know, we've got Robin Williams, as you said, and he, his character is Chris Nielsen. Yes. And the doctor, he suffered with his, uh, gosh, who played his wife? It was a a Annabella Scuri. That's her, yeah. They, they lost their children. Marie and Ian killed in a car accident. And it, off the bat, it's just incredibly mm -hmm. tragic, tragic story. Mm -hmm. I watched the trailer again before watching the movie just because i wanted to sort of get into the i don't know i wanted to get into the feel of what it would have been like back in 1998 you know what i mean and, yes. and so I I, yes. I I hunted on youtube found the trailer I'm like okay i'm gonna watch the trailer as if i'm then going to the movies to watch mm -hmm. the movie and you're right when you said earlier you, you can't see the trailer and think oh this is this is going to be a laugh fest you know <laughs> Good old Mork and Mindy. <laughs> you know you're going into a sad... There's like two types of Robin Williams movies. Sad Robin Williams movies and funny. And there's there's sad and funny in both of them. In all of the movies that he does. But this one is definitely a sad movie. It is. He, that's the genius of Robin Williams is that he can create that within a, a, a right, movie. Right, exactly. And he can make you laugh in a sad movie. He can make you cry in a funny movie. Yes. But, but you're going to a movie that's going to be inherently hilarious or inherently gut-wrenching when you go and see a robin williams movie yep so you know they lost their children in this car accident and annie then was consumed with depression which almost destroyed yes. their marriage she blamed herself she did yeah absolutely. and this is this almost destroyed her uh, marriage they rebuilt their relationship and they sort of found some comfortable ground to stand on it's a sort of ha. Ah, here we go. Here's the respite for for a brief right. moment uh, before the waterworks start again. Uh, and and exactly. you know, then this is tragic moment where he, Robin's character Chris, stops one night to help a motorist who has a car wreck, and it was in a, a tunnel. And the car flips. Very metaphorical. Very metaphorical. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh man, I'm getting chills just talking about it. And the car flips, and you know that Chris is struck by the car, and, he, and he's killed. Mm -hmm. And he, I don't use the word wakes up, but he, right, right. you know, he finds yeah. himself in another place. He finds himself back home, actually. Yes. 
and that's where he meets Albert, played by uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., um, who is become he's basically a spiritual guide, right? And uh, it's like he realizes he's passed away, and he's got to move on to the next world. So the and the movie goes on where he, he's got to discover the afterlife, and and it can become whatever one envisions. It's the dream of um, the Green Lantern, <laughs> if you will. Oh yes. Uh, but in <laughs> with, but go. in a tragic <laughs> setting, which really is also the movie. It was tragic. The Green Lantern. In a different way. Right. <laughs> Very different way. <laughs> I digress. But when he's in this, he envisions paradise. And this is the cool thing. He's like, you know, I'm, yes. I'm picturing paradise here. And there's uh, the paintings of his wife. The grass is just incredible you know you've got the it's so yes. colorful and and it's watercolor and it's moving and it's not quite in focus almost because yes huh. it's yeah uh, it's visually breathtaking it really it really is and and you look at it you think, gosh this was 1998 which again was to uh, ahead of its time oh it was in, way ahead in, of its in time what you're doing. oh phenomenal no movie was doing anything close to this in 1998 no and he gets to meet his children um and they have a different appearance the one that they had in in previous life and then annie overwhelmed annie's all alone yeah we were shown before they go she's going through this depression and we have this you know tragic thing back on earth and and so she's inconsolable she's on her own and commits suicide but she goes to hell mm -hmm. Uh, she goes right. the other way, um, and so Chris wants to go, and but just a great heart gut wrenching thing. I want to be with Annie, and so yes. he soulmates. is yes yeah, soulmates, and he wants to go and reach Annie in hell, and that is the story. That's 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 what it's about, and it's really hard to do a quick recap of the movie because it really is. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts in this movie, and one relates to each other, and it's also told a lot through flashbacks. Mm. So a lot of the information that we get as we're moving forward um, is flashbacks to, you know, other times in their life. And we're like, how does this relate? And it all starts to relate the more and more that you dig into it. We're almost going through um, Chris's mind of mm. what he's remembering and how right. his life experiences then relate to his current experiences that he's trying to, like, figure out. Yeah. <laughs> The one thing about uh, What Dreams May Come, though, is that it's so visually breathtaking mm. um, and it's so emotional. I mean, there's a lot of just deep, deep emotion that is in this that you're that you're navigating through that if you just take the movie for those two things, that it's emotional and that it's visually stunning um, and it's a world of paintings. You, you also kind of lose just how breathtaking the whole movie is because even the scenes in the house, even the scenes of just the two of them, the flashback scenes, I mean, everything is so gorgeous and this attention to color, um, the reds, purples, and blues, um, they are very significant and I'm still trying to figure it out. I think um, Annie always wears red when she's in love. I think she always wears blue when she's depressed. And I think she wears purple um, when she's just effervescent and in life. And, you know, the the purple in the tree and the purple in her clothing. Um, I could be very well wrong because I've never actually found anything of what the director says to the contrary. But I see those three uses of color and they mix and match. They're in Chris and they're in Anna and they're also uh, in Annie and then also in the kids as well. There always seem to be little splashes um, of those colors. But... If you take away all the visual aspects of the movie, there is so much more going on. Um, a, a lot of times when I'm talking to people um, about what dreams may come, it's always like, isn't the painting world so fabulous? It is. Isn't the story also fabulous? I mean, we're kind of forgetting that there are some like amazing nuggets that are within the story that gives you really lessons about life. Um, about life here, you know what I mean? Not so much about the afterlife, if you will, but there's a lot of nuggets about what you can take with you now. Um, one of the things that Chris says in the beginning of the movie is that paintings are the most important and interesting thing in this world. And that totally relates to why he would pick, you know, his afterlife place to be in paintings. Mm. It's something he absolutely adores. Um, and when Chris is willing to see himself, he utters, I still exist. And this existence theme is very consistent throughout the movie. Uh, there's one point where he actually forces Annie to write in her journey, or in her journal, um, I still exist. Um, when he's floating in the water 
uh, when he realizes he still exists, he floats to the top. I can also tell you that in mythology, water represents the unconscious mind. So a lot of times if somebody is struggling with something, they have them in water or around a body of water, and then they elevate themselves out of it, which is out of their unconsciousness to their consciousness. Mm. So there's another little metaphorical element in there. Um, so it's that koan that I exist, therefore I am, or I am, therefore exist. And, uh, and Albert, played by Cuba Gooding Jr., he even challenges Chris. Um, he'll say, what if you lost your limbs? Would you still be you? What makes you, you? And Chris is like, well, my brain is, I guess, what makes me, me. And he says, because it tells me things. And so, but Albert insists that the brain is just a body part. It's just muscle. If you are aware you exist, then you exist. Another nugget is that the bodies that Chris's kids chose, they, both Marie and Ian, they didn't, they didn't represent themselves to Chris's character as the children they were when they died. They were both in, they were both somebody their father admired and they were both somebody their father listened to. The stewardess from the airline is who his sister or daughter decided to embody because he said that Asian women are so beautiful and wise and intelligent. And he talked so much about her that she wanted to embrace that form to be probably listened to and feel beautiful and feel important. And Ian chose the form of one of Chris's uh, mentors in life. An older man who his dad always listened to and always um, understood. And so that kind of touches in an aspect of our childhood. Of, of I'm sure a lot of us didn't always feel listened to by our parents. And if we could be that other adult that our parents listened to for just a second, those deep conversations we'd probably be able to have with our own parents instead of um, always being seen as the kid. Always being seen as I don't have enough experience to talk to you like an adult, or that my my opinions don't matter. Uh, life, death, emotion, wisdom, the roller coaster that that you, you go on through this movie that you will be taken on. Oh yeah. Even if you've lived an incredibly sheltered life, I think you will feel it. The, but these are just the icing on the cake. Yes. What's the deep cut to you? What do you think the what do you think the, the you know the deep underlying? What is this film truly about? What is the underlying deep cut of what this film? is about when you when you when you get down to the the ingredients of it what is it all about when you dig down into it and you really look at all of the surface level stuff and you kind of let that drift away i really think what dreams may come is about being together it's about needing each other um chris is willing to go through hell because he needs annie it, it's all about through death and life through all the boring and all the silly adventures that we do everything in between it's about being there for each other and not giving up on each other. There's the great line in the movie, it's not about understanding, it's about not giving up. And then in Stephen Simon's book, The, the Force is With You, he actually has this wonderful description of his belief, and then I'll quote it here. He says, It is part of my belief system that we do travel through the ages in soul groups. We have karmic bonds to one another, and we will help each other grow and learn through a myriad of lifetimes. We change the roles and relationships to each other, but always help each other learn and incorporate whatever lessons we have chosen to experience in a specific incarnation. I also love that he gives this... Um, this visual example, I'm a visual learner, so I love visuals. He said, it's like there's a big boardroom meeting in the afterlife and all of us who are in between lives, who have a soul group relationship, sit around a big table, well, at least a virtual one, and discuss what we need to learn and how best we can help each other with whatever those lessons will be. And I was so moved by this visual and this idea that we're all together in these soul groups, that these the people that we meet in our lives are the people we're supposed to meet in our lives because they're going to help us on, and we're gonna help them on all of these little journeys. And I was so moved by this that I actually, I wrote and directed a film, a short film, it's online, it's called Loss. And it was the first one I did with Karmic Courage that was a big crew. We had like a 30 crew members. And the movie is about a woman who happens to see um, uh, happens to see death in the physical form when her father dies. And uh, death is amazed because no one else has seen him in like thousands of lifetimes. So he's curious. How can you see me? Why is it that you can see me? Um, and so he actually takes her. Um, and instead of a boardroom meeting, we had a living room. 
And it was this idea that everybody gathered together, her father who she thought she lost, her aunt, uncles, everybody in her life was all gathered in this living room and there was music playing and they were laughing and they were talking about their great adventures. And Death explains to, uh, to Elsie what is going on and how you're going to be here too um, and your adventure continues. And don't you want to have great stories when you come to this room to then tell them as well? Now, I probably should have called the movie uh, Lost because um, a lot of people confuse it with the TV show J.J. Abrams made. I did not make the J.J. Abrams show. <laughs> <laughs> and also because the idea was really lost on some people. <laughs> There was, there was a good many of even art fe film festivals that are like, I don't get it. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it was, so that was my way of taking uh, his book and those lessons and what dreams may come too. You know what I mean? That kind of element of it. And just take that little chunk out and say, isn't this part awesome? <laughs> Is that is that film available online? It is. See, or yes. Okay. Yeah. The the trailer and the full film. I'm trying to remember. It's it's under 15 minutes. It's been a while. Um, I think okay. I made that one in 2007 or eight. <laughs> we'll, we'll put it in the show notes so yes. uh, people can people can find that. Yes. Lost by Cape Chaplin. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so, in all of that, do you believe in reincarnation? I do, but I did not come by it lightly. Um, I was not grown up, or I was not, I did not grow up in um, a culture or even a family group that, that believed in it at all. I was, I was brought up as non-dominational uh, Christian and I was in Sunday school. I had my own kid's Bible with my name on it. Um, I was an altar girl. I looked forward to putting out the candles and all that kind of good stuff. Um, church was a big part of my life growing up. Um, my mother suffered a mental breakdown. And she was hospitalized. And after that, we were told not to return to church. Um, and I had a hard time with it. I was furious. Um, I spent many years really angry with the religion of Christianity. Um, not Sorry, not actually so much about the religion that is Christianity. It was the people. It was the people that actually were saying that my mom didn't have enough faith um, to be part of the church, um, that she had to be separated. So that's why you, that's why they were, you were asked not to go to church. We were asked not to come back. Yes. Because my, wow. because my mother was hospitalized. Um, my mom, her faith never changed. Um, she is still very, very strong in her faith. And so is my father. And I admire that and I honor that, but it did change mine. Um, it was one of those things in, in my teens after my anger had subsided, cause it took a while, um, for that anger to uh, subside. I turned to education. Um, I knew that this emotion wasn't going to suit me at all. So I took a summer and I studied as many religions as I could. Um, I wanted to find something that was closely connected to me, but also set out the person that I wanted to be. So I was finding out both. Who is the person that I want to be and what is the foundation that is closely related to that? Because I believed in something, but I didn't know what to call it. I also have a thing with labels. I hate labels, but yet you feel like you need to have a label. It's really <laughs> quite weird that our culture has that. Um, so I got this fantastic book called Religions of America and I studied it and I looked at the religions that they had in there and I, I really, I went hardcore with this. I had charts, I had graphs, I took notes. The fantastic thing was, is that I found how many religions were the same. They were really, the core principles were all the same. Be good to each other, be a good person, give to others. And so it was one of those things where when I was finding so many similarities and really not that many differences, the one difference that actually came into it was the afterlife. That's where a lot of uh, religions differ is where it comes into the afterlife. I believed in reincarnation and I believe in reincarnation still. I felt like I was making the same mistakes in my life over and over again. Also, when a situation was new, I felt like I hadn't learned a particular lesson from before and then vice versa. There was things that I was good at that I had no reason to be good at. Um, my dad's favorite example of this is in middle school, uh, we had a talent show and I, I didn't want to audition for the talent show. I didn't really want to do the baton twirling or the singing or anything like that. So I asked if I could be one of the announcers that would announce the new kids that were coming on. 
And I got up there, absolutely no problem, in front of the entire middle school and did my announcements. My my dad thought it was the most amazing thing ever that I had no fear of public speaking whatsoever. And I just don't think about it. Um, I And before that, I had never talked in a room full of people. I had never done it before. And in most of my social situations, because I was a 1980s kid, which is the be seen, not heard, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So I didn't have opportunities to even like perform in front of a a safe family group or anything like that. But in middle school and even today, speaking in front of people, it does not phase me. And so that does always make me wonder, why is it that that is natural to me and it's not in my family and it's not anything that I've done before? In your journey, in looking at all of the religions of the world, did you settle on one? Did you did you discover something that mm-hmm. uh, you know a particular religion jumped out at you and thought this is this is this is what you're going for, and 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 why? There was a few that made it onto the short list. Let's put it that way. But the religion mm-hmm. that I really dug and that I digged the deepest into uh, was Buddhism, and uh, I I chose Buddhism. That was the one that that spoke to me to my foundation, to my core, that I I really, there was nuggets there that I knew I wouldn't fully understand and I would be able to keep searching and keep getting better. Now, saying that I'm a Buddhist, I've been told it's a phase. Everybody goes through that phase, apparently. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't realize there was a phase. Um, I've also been told that I will never understand it because I'm not Asian. So there is all these terrible closed-minded things that I have heard um, just by saying that I'm Buddhist or that I'm a studying Buddhist. Now, I've been practicing Buddhism for 20 years. 20 year phase. So the then. phase thing, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm still in my phase apparently. I have really long phases. <laughs> <laughs> and because I did that journey, because I set out with uh, education um, and mm. learning about um, the variety of religions that are out there, I'm also going to um, to motivate my children to do the same, to find the religion that suits them. Um, and if, if they don't find anyone, that's that's fine as well. If they find one that they like that is the same that, that I am aware of, that's awesome as well. Um, but, but I believe that my choice actually made a stronger foundation. I didn't just do it because it was, you know, the way I had always been. It was, this is my choice and this is what I decided to choose. Um, And and that does bring us back to what dreams may come because uh, he talks about in making the the movie, the reactions afterwards. Um, And he talks about a dinner party where he, after the movie was released, he had four people come up to him. And the first one was, the first person was very upset um about how the film and how about all suicides go to hell um and he called him an inhuman monster for that uh the next person that came up to him thanked him so much for making a beautiful film about suicide (laughs) completely opposite from the first person the next person the third man came up and he was very angry um and he upbraided him about uh and it actually says quote Finally having the opportunity to do a spiritual movie about the afterlife and destroying it with the use of traditional Christian messages throughout the film. (laughs) Right behind that man (laughs) came up to him and it was a young man who thanked him for making such a great film that did not have one single traditional Christian image in it. (laughs) So as Albert says in the movie, uh, we see what we want to see. And that's the great thing about what dreams may come is that it's going to mean something different to everyone. And it's so universal in its storytelling that you can take it with so many different aspects of religious foundation and see what you want to see about it. I found this movie, it it hit me in in powerful ways. Suicide is something that I've experienced at an incredibly personal level, both my my parents uh, took their lives when I was five and a half. My, oh my sister gosh, took... I had no idea. And and I know that you didn't. I did not know that. I don't know if I would have picked this movie as the first one if I actually would have known that. You know, I think it was that this was it was really good that you did actually. And I, I serendipitous. I, I it, 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 I'm telling you, it's one of those things. You know, thirty years on, it's not the issue that it was to me then. And uh, it's funny people will say to me. You know, I'm so sorry. You know, you lost your parents. Ah, right. Thirty years ago, I'm, I have moved on. I'm, I'm. You can tell I'm. <laughs> you have to. You have to move on. Yes, but at the same time, still, when we say we're sorry, mm. we're trying to imagine what that would be for us. Yes. 
And so it's like, wow, I can get a teeny tiny little dot of what that pain might have been. Yeah. And to say they're sorry it, is it, what they feel. I feel like I have to say like, oh, OK, that little dot I got. Upset. It's, it's all you've got, isn't it? It's all you can yeah, say. Yeah. It's all you can say at that point. And then I, I lost my sister, although we were never close. We were actually separated. But I lost my sister in, in 2001 down the same uh. path. So, you know, there's this whole. And then, and then at that yeah. point, I, psychologically, I felt this incredible pressure on my head. It's like, well, so uh, my parents, my sister, does it mean I've got to commit suicide now? You yes. know what I mean? It's, no, it's don't. Sort of, yeah, your, your right. Your brain goes down a dark, very dark yes. way. Well, and also, it's, it, that's a m more terrifying. But, like, if your parents were both lawyers and your sister was lawyer, you would feel that same. It's it's the family group. It is. It's, it's, so, it's an incredible that's dynamic. a lot more terrifying. Yeah, and and so I, I, I made a very clear after going through some very dark times uh made a very yeah. clear i am not going to go down this path and right it, it's very easy to say but you know sometimes there are some just some dark moments you know I'm a, I'm a fairly jolly guy i i i follow the philosophy um of mark tupley from uh, martin chozowit yes who uh, always tries to be jolly and uh you know mark tupley at one point in the book uh, i don't know if you ever read uh, martin chozowit but uh i it, haven't I, I want to now phenomenal book and Dickens is just great in it. And Mark Tupley's character, you know, he wants to go and become a grave digger. And he said, why would you do that? He said, well, if I can't find, if I can't find something jolly in that, sir, ah, yes. then, uh, you know, what, what's there to be jolly about in life? Oh, so uh, nice. I, I think, yeah, this is this great. You know, it's what a fantastic outlook. You know, you, you, even in the sort of the darkest things, you can find something jolly, which is why I love Robin Williams. Absolutely. Something, you know, you look at Robin Williams, you know that... If you know anything about Robin Williams, you know the, the things that he struggled yes, with. Yes, absolutely. You know, through his life and the battle that goes forth. And yet he can still make you laugh and still mm -hmm. he is laughing with you and enjoying it despite the pain that he might be feeling. And I think that this movie has just an incredible, for me, yeah. personally, because you asked me, you know, what's my take on it? It has this incredible reflection on it. It's a, it's, yes. it's a beautiful movie. It's got a, this sort of... um. I don't want to use the word romantic, but it, there's a sort of this there is is sort of romantic, romantic yes. element to yes. it. Yes, it's also epic in a sense as well. I, I don't mean I don't mean romantic as in lovey dovey. Oh, right. I mean romantic in in as in poetry and as in poetic. Yeah. A, yeah. Expression of self. It's romantic. It's a romanticized idea of life. It's incredibly gut wrenching at the same time. So when it tackles with how do I handle you know the fact that this yes. uh, the person who commits suicide goes to hell reminded me of my early 20s i used to go to um uh, senior citizens homes in in around london uh, right. with some friends and we used to play music there we used to you know jam at the piano sing some old songs from the 30s and 40s and and and, and 50s and just entertain them with you know mm -hmm. some bing crosby or some you know uh, uh, uh some old satcho you know and just they, just, like, they loved it you know it's it great We're bringing happiness yes and what we would do in the summertime we'd we'd also then you know take some buns and burgers cook them up and give them to them and, and just sit down and talk to them and, and around the holiday time you know in, in december we'd bring some mince yeah. pies and sausage rolls and just sit with them and there's this one lady who i sat with and she used to go to church and mm -hmm. she stopped. I, I'm not religious one bit. I'm still trying to figure that out. Right. I'm still on. I'm still on my pre-phase of trying to work <laughs> Your out. Your pre-phase. <laughs> but I always find it interesting to hear what people believe and and why they believe it. And so she used to go to church. Yeah. And her husband committed suicide, oh. and the 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 priest told her that he he's gone to hell. Ah, uh, yes. And she said at that point, I didn't want to go to heaven. I right. did, at that point. She said, "That's it. I'm. I don't go to. I'm not going to go to church anymore. Don't care. I want to be with my husband. Absolutely. He is my soulmate." And so, watching this movie rem reminded me of, you know, this dear lady's. You know, I don't want to go. If he's gone to hell, then I want to go to hell. You know, that's right. And you there's a want to be together again. Yeah, I guess this spoke to me t on a personal level. It's so many different dimensions, so many different ways of, you know, just dealing with different messages. And right. part of me can see the strong use of traditional images yep. throughout the film. In, I think you hit the nail on the head. We see what we want to see. Yes. I also would add to that too. We see what we need to see. And I think mm. that's actually more important. Um, and that's why watching movies, if you're watching them with an open mind, in the sense of what is this movie going to teach me? Um, then you are, you are seeing what you need to see. Um, and I think that's a lot stronger. Um, because movies the way that they're constructed is not the same as our storytelling when we're sitting and we're talking to each other 
Mm. Because we get the interaction. We get to say, wait, did you mean this? Or inflection of voice and all these things. But when we're watching a movie, it's constructed for us. And it's not always constructed in a way that makes sense to one person. It's made to make sense to a whole. And so it's your job as, as a viewer to find what that movie means to you. I'll give you um, I'll give you an example. There's a movie called Thank You for Smoking. Do you remember this movie? I'm going to confess I do not. Okay. It's a movie about a guy that that is a lawyer for the tobacco industry. Oh, Aaron Eckhart. Aaron Eckhart. There we go. So I'm watching the movie and the movie is, it's okay. It's interesting. And I'm sitting there going, what is this movie going to teach me? Because I do this in every movie. There's a line in that movie, and this is why I can't do a whole episode on it, because really it's just one line. And it's about his strategy was to just to get the room to like him. It didn't matter what he said. It didn't matter if it was true or not. He just strived to get the room to like him. And so I can take that with my take that into my life. If I see people who are willing to say anything or do anything mm. to get a room to like them, mm. I may not trust them. <laughs> and do I do that? Do I say things just to get people to like me? And I don't. <laughs> so I was like, ha ha. I would say, not that I may not trust him, I, I will not. I cannot stand the salesman. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Which is really what that is. Yes, exactly. It's that sales yep. pitch. Years ago, I did a, I did a stint in retail. You know, like you said, you did the... the, the yes. I, I did that stint. I could, and my retail was only, I could only sell what I was passionate about. I tried to sell... Oh my gosh. I tried to work in a retail clothing store. I tried to work in a photography studio. I could only sell movies. I could only sell what I truly enjoy myself. <laughs> well, and, well, same for me. I actually worked in a tea store. Oh, yes. Um, selling tea, selling high-end tea. And we're talking about, like, people would come and drop thousands of dollars on, on tea. Like, it was insane. What? Ridiculous. Yeah. But it was, this was like... The... Do they not know that Lipton's available? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not get me started on the difference between Lipton and... The... I was just... Joking. Part of me says this tea is worth it because there are clear health benefits. You can pay... You, you, it's basically... You're not drinking tea at this point yes because you like the taste you're drinking it for the health benefits right absolutely the way that it's made and yes so i like i like the philosophy behind right. this company i'm not going to mention their name i like it <laughs> because i know they're still around i like their philosophy however ah uh. when i looked under the hood and actually started working there i was like ah yeah so all of this philosophy is just smoke and mirror it's a pitch it's all about the sales pitch yeah i might have accidentally taken a copy of their manual guide because I wanted to keep it because I was so shocked. Oh. And there is a line in the first chapter, and it's a thick book. When I mean, we're we're talking, wow. it's it's a good two two fingers of whiskey, uh, thick. More. <laughs> That's a good way to measure. Yeah, I like where, that. Where, where, it's a good way to measure anything. Isn't it? There is a line in that says the customer does not know Whoa. what they want. You need to tell them. Whoa. Right. And at that point, I'm like, okay, close the book. I have a problem with you. Oh my gosh. So for me, I completely agree with you. I cannot stand somebody who does that sales. I will, I will literally yeah. go the other way. I feel like I can almost smell it and sense it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just that little bit of not a true connection, yeah. not a true humanity that I'm reaching. And it's one of those things where I love people. <laughs> people make my life interesting and generally make my life better. So I, I want to get to know people. Um, people to me aren't numbers. Um, that's why, you know, very rarely, you know, I, I see like Facebook numbers and Twitter mm. numbers where they're sometimes like, hey, can we get like five more fans? You know what? <laughs> they're people. That number is really not going to matter at the end of the day. I would rather have five fans than 5,000. I want five people who are engaged and entertained and that I can talk to and we can learn from each other rather than a group horde that is not paying attention. I just want to make people better. Right, exactly. Yes. Who was that? It was um, Bach who said that. Johann Sebastian Bach, he said that, my lord, oh. I just wish to make them better. Exactly. It's yes. You know, I don't just want the numbers. I want to, I want to reach, I want to touch people in a big way. Yes. How do you separate, th you know, that salesman needs to be uh, loved yeah, yeah. to yep. the person who has the overwhelming anxiety slash uh, um, disbelief in themselves of, I just want to be loved. How do you separate that out when someone comes to you and, and it's not that they are trying to do anything for a like a sleazy right exactly way, but it's like they're trying to be they they want to be loved but not right for right the same reason. 
And so is there, do you have, still have that distrust? Not necessarily because I, I have learned this through looking back. I, I did not know this in the, in the moment, um, but by looking back, I get the greatest joy when I'm really helping somebody else. So if somebody is, you know, calling me or messaging me saying that they're having a really hard time with something, there's something in me that wants to help and it becomes nothing about me. It just becomes, let me help them. Um, and it's not like a problem to be solved. It's what if I'm the only person they're turning to? What if mm. I'm it and I'm too busy or I don't, you know, whatever. I, I feel it's our responsibility to be there for other people when they call on us. And so it becomes nothing about me and it becomes about helping them. And I will talk to people on the phone for like two and a half hours if I need to, to either if they need to just stop crying or if they need to vent or if they need to get something out because I still think that there are so many people that don't have that one person to talk to that it is my responsibility as a human on this planet to do that. And I will call out somebody who's not being honest with me. So if they're crying and they're, let's say they're playing victim mode, and this is a generalization um, because we, we all are playing victim to a certain extent. But if they're so circling their logic of, this is always happening to me. Why do other people always do this to me? I will call them on it and say, what responsibility are you allowing for this to keep happening? So let's yeah. talk about what you won't put up with anymore and what boundaries that you can put out there to not be treated that way, but also to not keep perpetuating the cycle. <laughs> so that's me. That I will still help a person who I feel is maybe being disingenuous and wanting attention, but I will call them on it and break down those walls as best I could because I can tell between with every person who's guarded, whether it's ego driven or victim blaming, they are hiding a great fear and it's, they want to talk about it, but it's hard to reach through that wall of fear. So it's one of those things you just got to keep talking. Human beings are amazing when they talk out their problems and it's very hard to hide it when you're talking it out. That's why Facebook and Twitter are not all that helpful because <laughs> we're still hiding. <laughs> in, in what dreams may come, do you see Chris as the victim or do you see Annie as the victim or, or neither, and neither the victim within this? I'd almost say neither. Um, I don't see that neither one of this victim, they both had tremendous amount of circumstances put on them and saw no other way. That made their, their decisions that they made made sense for their character. Mm. And also, they just wanted to be together. I mean, that's why, you know, Annie... And, and the thing about um, the, you know, suicides go to hell, actually, in the movie, um, it was Albert said suicides go someplace else. Yeah. It was Chris who said they go to hell. So yeah. I, I loved that because it was someplace else. This can be whatever, you know, your mind, you know, creates, but... But Chris had to verbalize it in a way that a lot of us can understand, and it's easier to understand for a trailer. So the, her, their decisions was to get to each other. I mean, she really thought she had absolutely nothing left and missed him so much that she would uh, would rather leave than always be reminded of him. And he... So it's the antithesis of a victim, right, really. Right, exactly, yes. But And he wouldn't be without her. So, I mean, he was, you know, I, you remember he couldn't visualize the cup. The cup was still all, uh, uh, paint and doughy. He mm. couldn't envision mm. that he was where he was because he was still in denial because he just wanted to be with Annie. He couldn't live in her painting without being with her. Um, so they mm. are and they aren't. Um, they did what they felt was best so they could be together. And that was the driving force for both of them. This is kind of slightly uncomfortable feeling i guess probably what you had with the realization of just you just watch this movie that's you know, covering suicide and oh gosh your you know your family commit suicide right. that, that same kind of odd feeling where you're watching you know a movie that covers suicide and the actor has just recently committed suicide right that is it is such a weird thing and I, I love this movie so much i felt like it was a good healing movie to watch mm. but then at the same time it's completely bizarre i mean it's almost, you know, is it life imitating art or art imitating life? And is that almost kind of the point 
um, where we're so entrenched with with uh, with our movies and with our life that the two of them are kind of symbiotic in a way. Um, all I know is that if the afterlife is anything close to the movie that Robin Williams was in, um, is that somebody is basically going through hell right now uh, to get Robin Williams back. Um, he is so beloved that people would not let him just go gently. Um, that people would uh, that people would fight for him. I know I would. <laughs> um, and then what we were saying that the movie does actually mm. it covers different points of view on suicide. Um, which is nice. And not a lot of movies even bother to have a second point of view. They just bother to say, this is the main character's viewpoint. We're going to go forward with that. And then the the villain is going to maybe have a little bit of a different mm. point of view. But that villain's wrong because they're the villain. Um, this is really neat. Um, I mean, and Albert explains, or not explains, um, uh, he actually talks about that suicides are, they're self-absorbed and they reject the natural order to their journey and that Annie won't accept it what she's done. Now, I've heard that being said about other, about people who have committed suicide, that they're being selfish, that they're not willing to take their journey. But I loved, and I more personally related the fact that Chris did not accept that. Um, he was bound to go through Helen back um, to bring her back. I like the two sides of the suicide um, issue, the selfishness, but then also the forgiveness. I mean, that speech that Chris uh, gives to Annie, where he says, thank you for things, where he says, I love you for things, that really, that beautiful long list of things that he feels that he has to say. I don't think there's a person on earth who has not experienced death and thought that um, about the person who is no longer with them. That 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 moment of being able to say, this is how you touched my life and this is how sorry I am that I didn't be able to give you more in this little span of time um, that we had. Um, so I, I know the one thing about suicide, it's the hardest on the people it leaves behind. Those are the people who really have to deal with it. That guilt of not knowing what to do or not have done enough, um, not have saying that, you know, they, they love them um, as many times. And I think this movie does a great way of turning that pain, allowing the characters to be able to say goodbye, allowing them to be able to say that they loved each other, and being able to never give up on them. I think it's a really nice foundation, if you will, of if they can do it, maybe I can do some part of that as well. It's important to clarify that I've, this is something that I've come to learn, you know, I, I used to initially feel that suicide is incredibly selfish. And I realized it, it's selfish from my perspective, but it's actually incredibly selfless right. from the perspective of the person who took their life. They are not doing it in a selfish way. Right. Yeah. It's, right. They're not doing it if I want no, attention. It's no, not you're not going to. Yes. They exactly. are like, I, I am, I'm, I have got so much pain. I love this person so much. I do not want them to have this pain. Mm -hmm. And, and through the, the mental illness and through the, the darkness that they are feeling, that mm -hmm. is their solution. And I, I, I struggle with people who, when Robin Williams, com, you know, committed suicide, well, that was incredibly selfish. And I struggle with that because is no, he right. didn't do it out of being... He wasn't being incredibly selfish. Yeah. I understand that feeling, right. but it's not true. Right. And I can totally see that. I, I don't see it as what part of it would be selfish. Yeah. Um, I, 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 my brain does not go there, um, that it's a selfish thing. It is the people who stay yeah. are being selfish of, I want more time with that person. It's perspective. It's all about mm -hmm. perspective. Right. So there's, and there's more that can be done, right? Absolutely. Mental illness is something that I think this country starts talking about and then brushes it away and then starts talking about it and then brushes it away. It is something that we really do need to talk about a lot more. Um, and if nothing else, movies like this bring awareness and, uh, and, and they spread the conversation that we can talk about it. Because when we talk about mental illness and depression and suicide and anxiety, we are lessening the fear of it. We're lessening the shame of it. 
and we're not putting a stigma on those who are suffering. Um, I can tell you in Indianapolis, where I am in September, we have an out of the darkness walk and it's hosted by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and it's on their website, AFSP. Um, and there are a variety of walks that are happening cities throughout the year. Um, the Indianapolis walk happens September 13th. This is a great way to have your voice heard, to stand up, to give this cause some attention. We've all been giving ALS a wonderful amount of attention with the Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, but if this mm. is something that yeah. is close to your heart, um, that has touched you, this is almost a way to make a movie into an action. Um, to find a walk near you and to learn more about the American Foundation um, uh, for Suicide Prevention. I really, I really believe in it. I, I do still find it incredibly odd that an actor who made me laugh and cry and think deeply about this life experience has actually left us. But I know that he is immortalized in film. Um, I, you know, we started at the top of this where, you know, Charlie Chaplin, if he wasn't immortalized in film, I might not have started making movies. I might not have had that moment of connecting movies to something that I could do. Um, but Robin will never truly leave us. Um, he's going to continue to make us laugh. He's going to continue to make us think. I wish that his powerful play went on and he was able to teach me new things but at least we got to spend some time together in his universe and play. And so to paraphrase the first and last words of what dreams may come, when I was young, I met this wonderful man who made me laugh. Till next time, Robin. For more information about this show, visit d20grip.com and use the keyword Kate's Take. Thank you for listening. I love the 20! <laughs>